Welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible study. We are continuing in the Gospel of John. Uh, we are in the final book uh, this week. We're starting in chapter 21. Uh, we welcome you tonight. We hope that uh, you are doing well and your family is doing well during this time of isolation. Uh, come and join us on Wednesday nights at 6.30 and Sunday nights at uh, 6 o'clock for Bible studies as we go through our, our services. Uh, if you'd like to follow us on Facebook, you can find us at Community Church at Cedar Springs, and you can find the rest of our, our videos for our services and Bible studies on uh, Community Church at Cedar Springs on YouTube. Tonight, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we just thank you for the, for the ability to wake up this morning, Lord, to be able to get out of bed, to be able to uh, walk across the floor. Lord, we just uh, thank you for all the the blessings that you've given us that, that we don't even know about or the things that you do for us, the, the problems that you move out of our way, the obstacles that you destroy before we uh, come to them, Lord, that you uh, make a way for us to come and, and be in your presence, to be able to worship you uh, and to follow you, Lord. I, I just pray for every family that, that is dealing with uh, this uh, virus, whether it's out of fear, with their, whether it's out of uh, fighting the virus out of their body, Lord, I just pray that you give them all strength and comfort and, and peace in this time of uncertainty, Lord. Lord, we, this reassures us that uh, we don't have any control over our future. We don't have any control over anything that happens uh, past the, the moment that we're living in, Lord. And we know we've been faced with this uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. We can't make plans like we thought that we could, uh, but we know that you are in charge, Lord. We know as your children that you're going to take care of us. We know that you have a plan and you are not surprised at all by the events that are going on and that uh, something wonderful and awesome will grow uh, from this time in isolation, Lord. We're just asking that you move in people's hearts and in their lives, Lord, that you will uh, stretch them, uh, that you will grow them, and, and that when we finally are able to get out of our homes and socialize again when we come back together, that we will be a, a, a mighty force in your name, Lord, that we will uh, be renewed in spirit and strength and, and follow through to your will. Lord, tonight as we're going through this lesson, we just ask that you reveal yourself to us in a way that will draw us closer to you, Lord, that we can find out a, a, a new side of you that we didn't know before. Lord, I we're here because we love you and we praise and worship you, not for what we can get from you, but because of who you are as, as our sovereign uh, Lord and, and Savior. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, tonight we're in chapter 21. Pull this up here so we can all get on the same page. Oh. There we go. Uh, let's read through uh, verses 1 through 14, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It said, After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, and Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples uh, were gathered. I am going to, out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus came and stood on the shore, but the disciples did not real realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many in the net, it was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So let's let's look at some of the, the scripture here and and we're talking about it. So we we just got finished with Jesus uh, showing himself to Thomas, who had doubted, said that he wouldn't believe Jesus unless he could touch his hands and, and feel the wounds uh, in his side. And of course, Jesus offered him uh, that chance to do that. And, and so it says, after all of this, they were by themselves again. And Simon Peter said, uh, I'm going fishing. And so we don't, you know, there's some speculation. We've talked about this in one of our other classes as well, that uh, speculation on whether or not they, they still didn't truly understand what was going on and they were going back to their old habits because they were fishermen. And so they were going back to their old vocations in, in their own way, old ways. Uh, or it could have been just as simple as, you know, they enjoyed fishing. And, you know, they had a rough week with uh, his death and crucifixion, even though he uh, showed himself again. The, the Jewish leaders were still hot and heavy over uh, destroying his ministry in that way. So this may have been just a, a, a way for them to break the tension and kind of relax a little bit. Uh, fishing is not my thing to do to relax. Uh, but for a lot of people, I know that is. Uh, any anybody else have any any thoughts on why Peter would have said uh, I'm going fishing? Sometimes uh, it is, isn't it common to go back to do what you know or what you learned or or or, or whatsoever? Uh, he went back to his old ways. Um, it, it, I think it goes deeper than that, Charles. Um, Three and a half years ago, he left his nets and he followed Jesus. True. Um, and and the way Matthew reads, uh, we're led to believe that that they give up that occupation. Mm -hmm. They did. And, and obviously, uh, he did the same thing that many of us do. We don't completely turn loose of the old ways. Right. Yeah, he went back to his old way. Yeah, but he never had turned loose of them. He, obviously, he still owned the boat. He still had nets in good repair, although it's been three and a half years since he fished. Well, it, it was three and a half years since he fished, but his father never stopped fishing. Remember, they left their father. Right. They left the crew. Right. So the crew was still there. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. He went back to what he knew. Yeah. yeah. And I I kind of see that way too. Like I said, some of them just think, hey, it's a, let, let's have a break and go do this. But it's uh there's, again, we, we, we can't discount them or, or rebuke them too hardly in that though, as far as our nature. We go back to what's comfortable to us, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so fishing was comfortable, comfortable to him. Uh, the three years would have been awesome to to have witnessed, but it was hard. Uh, there was a lot of hardships. There was a lot of, uh, I won't say pain and suffering, but I mean, you, you know, they they left their homes, they wandered around, they slept outside, they wherever they could find. Uh, they were being pursued by by the uh, Pharisees. They were uh, there were some towns that welcomed them in and treated them okay. There were other towns that ran them out of town and, and that kind of thing. So uh, fishing was a, a comfort. It was something uh, they could grasp onto. It was something they had a, a little control over. Um, you know, if if you're if you're a fisherman. You may have some bad days, but if you're consistent in, in the work that you put in, it'll eventually all work out. Uh, you, you, have a, you, you have a sense uh, of control over that situation. And that's what, you know, we're dealing with that a lot now that 
Uh, I know a lot of people that were confident in their financial stability because they had a good job and uh, they made a lot of money and they were able to handle their business. And now they don't have a job. Uh, they don't have any money to handle. Uh, they may be getting some unemployment or, or something like that. But as far as having a job to go back to, especially if they're a small business owner, uh, if they're going to survive this. And so there's an uncertainty that, that they have come up against that, that they are not truly in control. And uh, I think that's what we see in Peter and these guys. They, they came up to a point where uh, they had absolutely no control over the situation whatsoever. And they didn't have Jesus to fall back on either because he wasn't there. And uh, so they came, they went back to what was comfortable to them. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles had said, no, it was Rodney who said, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the reason everybody's buying up all the toilet paper because it's comforting. It's soft and it's, it's squishy and it's comforting. And, uh, they've lost a, their bearings or their footing for a minute. And that's what they grasp to is those, those creature comforts that we have. Right. Mm -hmm. But we, we look again in verse four and it says that just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore and again, the disciples didn't know who he was. And so we're, we're at an early morning again. Uh, and Jesus is about to reveal himself. And, and in what we just read, the translation said that he called friends. In some of the translations, he called them children. Uh, or it's translated as children. Either way, the, the greeting that he gave was not a typical greeting uh, that you would give uh, mm -hmm. another man, even if you knew who he was. So it was kind of odd. It was kind of an odd, uh, salutation to begin with. Uh, and when they answered, no, he said, cast it on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now the commentator that, that I pulled this from said that he researched and did not find any, anything that, that mentioned, uh, what side of the boat ancient fishermen would fish off of in the Sea of Galilee. Whether the, the right side of the boat was a, a bad luck or had some significance or anything else, we, we really don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's the fact that they were obedient in what he asked them to do. Uh, and we see some, uh, some other accounts of this story, right? Where they kind of argue with him. That, that we've been fishing all night. We, we've been doing this all our lives. Who are you to tell us what to do? Right. Uh, John doesn't, John doesn't put that in there, but, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it just shows that they were obedient and put it in over the, over the right side and they caught so many fish. They couldn't pull the net up. Right. <clears throat> and of course, John's recollection from that, uh, he's not going to make himself look bad in his own book, but uh, by, by arguing with Jesus, but, uh, supposedly he was the first one to figure out that the guy on the, on the shore was Jesus. And he turns to Peter and tells him, he said, it's the Lord. And of course, Peter, uh, in some translation says that he was, he was stripped for work, uh, <coughs> that he put on his outer garment and jumped in the, jumped in the water. Uh, I find that kind of, that, that scene from Forrest Gump when, uh, Captain Dan shows up on the pier and Forrest is in there and he just kind of runs off the end of the boat. Uh, I can kind of see Peter doing that as well. And evidently he was a pretty good swimmer because from the account that Paul gets is he made it to the shore before the guys in the boat did. He's a fisherman. Hey. Now, Nick, Nick, the uh, instance where they argued with Jesus uh, was early in his ministry when okay. he was calling his disciples. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Was that when, that's when he first called them, right? That's correct. Exactly. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. Which, which is pretty neat the way it, it you know, uh, the story makes a complete circle. And the second time they don't argue with him. Right. But they didn't know who he was. Maybe they learned not to argue. <laughs> people, <laughs> people hope I'm going to learn not to argue someday. Someday. Uh, I'm not going to hold up to that. I think I'll be dead and gone. Um, you know, but they they pull the they pull the the net. They finally get the net in after Jesus asks for some fish. So Peter comes and he drags the net in, 
and the the instance in that Paul or not, John specifically states that it was 153 large fish in this net. Mm -hmm. there, there's no known significance to that number 153 more than likely uh, it, it was common to take accurate counts of the fish that was brought in because it was split up among the fishermen right uh, they got paid uh, if you've ever watched the the deadliest catch they're they're pretty meticulous in the number of crab that they count as they bring it on the boat mm -hmm. uh, plus the fact you know every fisherman loves to tell uh, the story of the great battle of, of whatever fish they had I still you know, I remember my dad caught a, I don't know, it was about an eight pound <coughs> wide mouth bass. It was, it was a good size uh, bass, but he caught it on a uh, two pound micro filament rod. He was fishing for bluegill in the uh, swamps of Georgia and had a guy that was manning the boat and they fought that fish for three hours in the swamps before he tired him out and basically floated to the top of the water. And uh, <laughs> that was the, that was the greatest catch. He had it, he had it mounted and hung in the living room for years. But that was the greatest catch of his catch of his life that he caught a uh, like an eight ten pound bass on a two pound test line with a little micro reel. So fishermen fishermen love telling stories about their conquests, especially if they're they're extraordinary. And this would have been an extraordinary uh, amount of of fish that was in there. And so I think that's a probably the only reason that John uh, put those in there uh, was just just to kind of give validity to uh, the account that was going on because I would say more than likely in that village a hundred that catch would have been talked about for a while after that because uh, it wasn't just mm -hmm. the disciples in there that was the the village that was around in that area that's where the the boats would have docked in uh, to unload their catches and that kind of thing, and to have uh, that many in a in a net uh, and the net not break would have been something that that probably would have been talked about for quite a quite a bit after that. But uh, then we go down to verse twelve, and then he says, "Come and have breakfast." And then this is this is a little uh, odd here too. It says none of the disciples dared ask him who he was because they knew he was God. <laughs> Yeah, or knew he was the Lord. Now, if they knew he was the Lord, why would John put down that they they didn't dare ask him who he was? Well, if now wait a minute. Knew who he was? Why would he? Why would he mention that? Well, yeah, yeah but, but but go back for a minute. You uh, th that was at the at the beginning as, as he was talking about it. By the time they got to to the shore, they knew who he was. Mm-hmm. By the time they got to the shore, so so uh, from from the boat to the shore, recognition took place with the rest of them. Right. But we we look at this too, though. Is the thing is he says come and eat, and then it says that Jesus came. So he invited them to come and sit down, but evidently they didn't come all the way, or they didn't go the way because it says then Jesus came. The way that I'm reading it says Jesus came and took the bread to them. So whether or not they, they came or, or he's just saying, you know, that he was the one that served them. But uh, uh, again, there, there's kind of a, a questioning is either they, they didn't really recognize his physical form, uh, but they realized through his voice and his mannerisms or what was going on that uh, it was Jesus at that time. And I forgot a part on too. We'll get to it in just a second. Yeah, you know what I'm thinking about. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Give me a second. Uh, so, going back to the um, the statement, none of them dared to question him. I wonder if that goes back to um, talking, thinking about uh, Thomas and and his doubting. Right. And, and uh, again, we're 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 not really sure if he if he was in a. Uh, it, it, okay. So let, let's try to piece this together a little bit and kind of rationalize out what, what's going on in the events is we, we have this town that, that these fishermen came from. The village knows or the, the area knows that these seven guys left their, their occupation to follow Jesus. They had to know that these guys were disciples of Jesus. 
They had to know mm -hmm. who Jesus was at that time. They have had to have at least heard the stories of the, of the crucifixion, if nothing else. And yet the only seven people that recognize who he is or even mention who he is are the disciples. And when they, and, and for me, I, I, I have to kind of wonder if, again, Jesus, Jesus hasn't changed his outward presence, that he doesn't look like the Jesus that walked uh, for those three years in his ministry, that he looked like someone else. And the only way that the, the disciples knew about it is it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. If we go back to the fact that Jesus equipped those, the 12, when he breathed on them, what we read about in the last chapter, uh, to be able to do the work that John felt Jesus's presence, even though he didn't see the, the physical representation of Jesus. And then he, he expands that to Peter. It's like, hey, it's, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. Uh, and, and so when they came back, and that's, that's kind of how I ra rationalized that particular verse is they didn't ask, they didn't dare ask who he was, meaning that he probably didn't look like Jesus, but they all knew because of his presence in their life that that's who he was. Does that, does that make sense? It does. That's kind of how that's kind of how I take it. Now, I, again, I don't know. It, it could be something else. I wasn't there, so. You know, I was actually reading the first chapter of John today, and I had forgotten that um, John the Baptist. There's a statement in there that he didn't know him, even though when he saw him coming, he had said, "I'm not worthy of baptizing him." He told him, "I'm not worthy of baptizing him," but it said he didn't know him until the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's referring to a different type of no, the difference between a, a heart knowledge and a head knowledge. It was when the Holy Spirit descended upon him that he had the, you know, he knew that this man really was who he said he was. So I think this reference of they knew it was the Lord may be a similar reference. They didn't dare question him because they knew in their hearts who it was. There was no need to question. Right. Well, uh, I've read it. I've been sitting there reading a whole bunch of commentaries about the number 153 and numerologists and, and theologians and St. Augustine and, and the most popular theory and the one that I seem to like the best is that John included a specific number uh, simply because he wanted to make sure that people, his readers didn't think it was a fish tale. Uh, that, you know, fishermen have a, a, a history of exaggerating sometimes. And he wanted a specific number to help uh, his readers believe uh, that he was seeing a, a man who had died uh, on a cross, uh, alive on a beach with a fire going. Yeah. Well, you stop and think about it. Uh, it's early in the morning. They've been fishing all night. They haven't caught anything. Uh, they hear a man on the shore, on the shore, a hundred yards away, who has fish cooking <laughs> and yep. bread. Yep. Uh, let's, 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 let's just, just give thought to that. Fish cooking and bread, everything already prepared. Uh, think about who does that for us. Who's the bread of life? Who is our provider? Mm. Uh, who, who, who was looking after us day as well as night? Nobody but him. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, 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 I can, I can almost see them saying, oh, you know, that's nobody. That's gotta be him. It's gotta be. Everybody else has been out here fishing with us. We know who's out here. We, 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 we've hollered back and forth between boats all night long to keep from crashing into each other. So we know who is out here. All of a sudden, here is somebody who wasn't out here with us, but he's got fresh fish and bread already prepared for us, and all we've got to do is go eat. Stop and think about it. That's right. Yeah. One of the things that I, that I like, two things that are referenced in this, uh, these, la these two verses that we're talking about that, that really struck me as, uh, as, Christ being our provider is one what you were talking about the fact that even though he he was he had shed his his uh, human confinement and his his 
deity presence is now present after the re after the resurrection he's still serving his disciples he's he's doing the cooking uh he's doing the serving uh e even though that that he's transpired past that that humanly form uh that they have and the other part of that is is that it, john makes a makes a count after the the specific number of fish and he says that even though there was that many the net wasn't torn and we can kind of look at that is, is the fact that uh, <coughs> that the the church's resources, as long as Jesus is in the midst of it, will not go overstrained. Uh, that that if we allow Jesus to be in the midst of, of the tools that we use, uh, that they will outperform uh, what their normal uh, tasks are are done. That's whether our our funding resources or, or um, our outreach resources and that kind of thing from the church or ourselves, as long as we allow Christ to work in that, he'll make it go further than anything we could, we could do on our own. But he is a provider. He is. My man. Uh, then we go down to 13, 14, the last couple of verses of this. It says that Jesus came out and took the bread to them and the fish. And again, I, I can't help but think of the the uh, fishes and loaves and feeding the 5,000 uh, during this again, which I, I understand bread and fish is a common breakfast for Jewish people. Uh, not my cup of tea. I tried it. Uh, they're a little... <laughs> Their little slimy pickled fish or whatever they have for uh, breakfast. Uh, uh, it, it was hard to choke down. I did it once, uh, but that, that's uh, that's common for them uh, that they do. So fish and fish and bread were, would have been a, a very common breakfast for them to have at that time. Right. And uh, verse fourteen is a little odd too. It says that uh, the third time that Jesus revealed to the disciples after he's raised from the dead. So. Evidently, John doesn't see Mary Magdalene as a disciple, uh, because if we count if we count Jesus' revelation to her, this is the fourth time that he had he had revealed himself. So uh, that's just a just a, a little odd note in there as far as the recollection and the way that uh, that John uh, counts the disciples in in that. But I want us to to look at. The next section, and I think we can get through this next section here before we may not get through all of it. We may have to come back to it next week. But so verses fifteen through nineteen, these four verses. There's a there's a lot to really unpack in these as well. Or I'm sorry, it's longer than that, isn't it? Let's see. Yeah, 15 through 14, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Mm -hmm. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my fish. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would, be glor would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. So there's a there's a lot to really unpack into this this section, and we we see this as, as the redemption of Peter uh, mirrored against the the three denials that, that Peter had against Christ. We have uh, three denials there, and we have three redemptions listed here. And, and you know, to rationalize this, and I know I, I don't know if Hilda and Rodney were there when uh, Arlen did a devotion, one of his devotionals for uh, one of our Trace Dias meetings was about the, this particular meeting. And, and being there and standing on that beach where Jesus would have been calling to the men and coming up has a, a little different 
take on this, but in the beginning, in the earlier chapters, when we see when Peter denied Christ, he was standing around a charcoal fire. Uh, it was a it was a charcoal fire that that he was standing around getting warm that he denied him. And, and anyone who's worked with charcoal or cooked anything, you know that smoke, that smell gets in your clothes and it gets in your hair, and it gets in everything, and it just lingers there forever. And, and so you can imagine that that Peter had that lingering smell of that that charcoal and that smoke and that constant reminder of the denials and the uh, that he had given Christ during that time. And so now he's back on the shore and he's in Christ's presence again. And it's that same charcoal smell that he's, that he, he has to uh, have witnessed and, and remember that smell and going back to that. And, and so we have the, again, we have this, this mirrored back onto that, but Peter has to remember while Jesus is asking him constantly, do you love me? His mind has to be going back to that night standing around that charcoal fire out in the courtyard outside of Caiaphas's house. And, and I could see where at the third time uh, where Peter would be hurt uh, because it looks like Jesus isn't, it, it looks like Jesus is holding a grudge uh, kind of at this point uh, <laughs> that he does. But, uh, but it finally he's restored into that. It, it, it is a little odd and we can talk about this and you guys can kind of figure out the, the first two times that Jesus asked uh, Peter, if he loves him, we know that there were three main words used for love in the Greek language. Uh, we have Eros, which is the erotic romantic kind of love. We have Philos, which is a, a brotherly uh, kind of love. And then we have Agape, which is a, a unconditional deep love. And so Jesus, in the first two times he asked Peter, he uses the word agape. Peter answers all three times with philos. And then the third time that Jesus asks him, Jesus uses philos. So we have a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a question on why maybe that that Peter didn't use. Agape, uh, when he says, you know that I love you, uh, that he used a lower form of, of love, uh, almost like I, I respect you or uh, I'm fond of you as opposed to that. And again, the, we, we may see this as the, the uh, issue with him remembering the denials that he had and that him not feeling worthy of saying that he loved him unconditionally because he had already failed him three times before that. What about uh, just pure humility? Uh, Peter could be, have been in a humble situation. Um, I would say he was humbled. I, I would have been humbled myself after all that, that had taken place. Right. But I, you know, I, reading this, I, I, I missed a little bit of the nuance in this when uh, at Peter, at finally at the last, the first two, he says, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. And then he finally says, look, you know me and you know all things. And if you know all things, then you know that I love you. So mm -hmm. Peter finally stopped trying to rely on his own strength and his own power in showing that he loved and finally just gave in and said, look, it's you. You're the one right. that have to know this. I can't, um, you know what's in my heart. It doesn't matter what I say or what I do on the outside. You know where my, my inner part is. And so he mm -hmm. finally surrenders that part of himself into that last question. Um, but I want, I want us to look a little bit too there, so we've got the, the three redemptions in love. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about the differences in the, the word love that Jesus used and the word that uh, Peter used. But let's talk about the, the commission that uh, Jesus gave Peter during this a little bit. And, and we'll talk about, uh, so I, I guess the first thing we need to figure out is is there 
or do you feel that there's a difference when Jesus said, take care of my, or feed my lambs and feed my sheep? Is there a difference between lambs and sheep? Lambs, look, here's what I'm saying. Basically, you have the situation or the scenario here where you've got those who have accepted Jesus, who have been uh, walking with Jesus for a moment, which would be your sheep. But then you have those new ones who are just coming in, those new converts, which would be lambs. And to me, he was making it general and saying, you've got to take care of all of them. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, you know, and I think it's the the progression of, of we go back through that the the idea. Of, uh, I'm trying to remember how how exactly it's worded, but uh, for those who who are faithful and much get much, or something to that effect. If you well, oh, yeah, 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 you, you too much is given, much is required. Right. Is that what? You mean? Yeah. Yes. So we're we're looking at the at the transgre or the the building up. The first one is, do you love me? Yes, female lambs. Okay, spread the word to the new people. New people that that are gonna who I wasn't able to minister to. You're gonna be involved with. They're gonna ask questions or whatever else. Uh, tell them what's going on or, or share that to them. And then he goes and asks them again, do you love me? So he takes it to another level. Again, it's a it's another level of trust. And uh, he says, uh, yes, I love you. And he said, then take care of my sheep. And so take care of the people that, that knew me when I was alive. Uh, take care of the, make sure that they understand the, the mission is, is still on point and still working. And then the last one is feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. and again, so, so we're not, uh, so we're kind of, in, in the way that I look at it, it's kind of a step step up or pro progress uh, into uh, how much Jesus trusts Peter uh, to carry out uh, his ministry from there on. Well, let's also look at, at how happy Peter was. Uh, something that uh, I, I, I see in here that we really didn't say a whole lot about uh, was and I know you went over verse nine uh, with the fish and the uh, the charcoal, uh, uh, but also in verse ten it says, "Bring some of the fish you've just caught." Jesus said, "Right." Look at how excited Peter got. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net. It didn't say somebody helped him; he dragged the net with all the fish himself. I can say that. Evidently you, you, you see the excitement? You you, you 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 see how excited he is? Oh, yeah. uh, and 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 he's he's willing to do whatever. Whatever he has to do, he's willing. And and he's right there, and and he's he's at Jesus's complete disposal, and then all of a sudden Jesus comes in and says, "Wait a minute, let me talk to you for a minute, Peter." <laughs> he says, "Hold on, I want to I, I want to ask you a few things," and and he said, "Do you love me?" And then Peter said, "Yeah." He said, "What? Feed my lambs." <clears throat> Peter, okay, okay, Lord, I got you. I'll feed your lambs. I'll feed your lambs. In other words, I'm going to stop fishing now back out in the Sea of Tiberias, and I'm going to come back to the work that you have called me to. It, 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 in other words, I, I, I reneged on what we were supposed to be doing because I, I, I went back, I, I, and, and, and Peter said to himself, I'm going fishing. The rest of them followed him. Who else should he be talking to but Peter? Right. Peter was your natural born leader. You know, I look at this uh, three levels of restoration uh, because Peter three times denied uh, Christ. And 
And I look at it in that respect simply because when I met Jesus the first time, um, my forgiveness was, was once and done. But when I sin now, I can't just get blanket forgiveness like that. I almost have to, I almost have to confess each individual sin in order to feel uh, his, his healing and his forgiveness. Mm -hmm. and, and Peter would be in the same boat. You know, Peter had met Jesus, but then when Jesus needed him, he denied him three times. And I see three mm -hmm. levels of restoration to offset the three levels of denial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's look at, we'll look at, uh, let, let's look at verse 15 real quick and then we'll, we'll finish up here tonight and, and we'll finish up the rest of the chapter next week. But I, I wanted to, or, or I got sidetracked because I got all excited about the, the, the three loves, but <laughs> The, the question that, that Jesus asked Peter in verse 15, I think is important too. It says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And again, it kind of goes, with, you can have a couple of different meanings to that. Uh, some people think that that means that, that he's asking, do you, do you love me more than these other men do? Uh, but I kind of tell you what, what we have been talking about or alluding to a little bit. Uh, through this lesson, it's uh, to me, I think he's saying, do you love me more than this life it is kind of the way that I took it. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these things that you've set up for yourself? Uh, what we talked about, you know, the, the boat was still there, the net, the crew, uh, all that stuff was still there and, and holding on to, and he was holding on to them. Uh, it was really easy for him to to go back. It wasn't that, hey, I'm going to go fishing and then I, I've got to go and i got to find a a boat to lease and I got to see if there's some nets that are available. Uh, and that kind of, it was, <laughs> there you go. It was, there right you back, go. it was right back in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can't help but think maybe Jesus is asking him, do you love me more than, than this stuff that you've come back to? Nick, where, where were they having this conversation and what was laying at their feet? 153 fish. Well, you that's true too. Yeah. Feet? Do you love me more than these? Yeah. Do you love Do you love me more than you love this occupation? That's right. Well, I mean, 100, 153 big fish would have been a lot of money. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's money. That's right. I can see him yeah. point to him. I can see him point to this pile of fish at his feet. Do you love me more than these? And that's kind of where I'm coming from too. It's, it's, that's right. He, he's, he's asking to make a decision at this point. Are you going to follow the world? Or are you going to follow what you know? Or are you going to follow me? And that's what we see at the, at the last in, in verse 19, he says, and follow me. If, if right. you love me, <laughs> then, then you're going to leave all this other stuff, like really leave at this time. Don't, mm -hmm. don't put it aside in case it doesn't work out so you can come back to it again. Uh, mm -hmm. leave it completely aside and, and come follow me because mm -hmm. we, we know that, uh, when he says that you're old and you stretch out your hands, we don't rec recognize that. But at the time, the readers in the, in the first century would have realized that was would have, yes, uh, a, a marking or a, a description of crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, when you were young, you go wherever you wanted to, but when you get old, you're going to, Someone else is going to dress you. Someone's going to restrain you, and they're going to take you somewhere. Take you somewhere that you don't want to go. You don't want to go so that you can glorify God. And we know mm -hmm. uh, by tradition what happened to Peter and, and how he died. And so this, and this is what John tells us, uh, that Jesus was giving him uh, the prophecy of his own death. And even in that own death, he's saying, follow me. Uh, we, you know, we talked about that before too, is if you knew that how you were going to die, even if you knew how you were going to die, not necessarily when you were going to die, but how you were going to die, uh, would you content, would you continue on as if you didn't have that knowledge and do, uh, what God called you to do, or would you hide away and try to stay away from it? And so, uh, you know, this is the, the question that, that Jesus is asking Peter is this is, a 
it's time to double down and see to put the put the the feet to the highway and get going or or go back well nick you you just said it um jesus put peter in a position to say okay now peter here here we are um you love me okay you're gonna you're gonna keep my commandments you're going to feed my lambs you're gonna feed my sheep if you love me that means and as rodney just said look you're gonna cut the fish loose you're gonna become fishers of men uh we're not gonna go back to our old ways and Nick, you said it yourself, we're, we're guilty as charged. Uh, so many times of, of giving up when times get tough and just throwing up our hands and saying, I'm going back to what I was doing before. And, and even if it was illegal, we'll still go back and do it. How, I, I, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I've done jail ministry. I've seen guys, you know, profess their faith and what they're going to do when they get out and how they're going to live and how they're going to act as soon as they get out. For, for whatever reason, they found Jesus there in jail. That's, that's where they found him. And, and their desire is to follow him. They get out of jail. They go out. They try to find a job. They can't find one. Uh, they, they've got girlfriends, babies, mamas. They've got all these other people looking at them wanting finances, and and they can't seem to to make ends meet. What do they do? They re, instead of trusting in that same Jesus that they found in jail, they revert back to their old habits, and before you know it, it's a vicious cycle. They're right back in jail again. Yep. That's why about 90% of in, of long-term inmates are repeat offenders because they, uh, they can't make decisions on their own. And in jail, you don't have to make any decisions. And, uh, they, they don't know how to, uh, they don't know how to get out of the environment that they're in and, mm -hmm. and nothing against, against people that do jail ministry or preachers that do that. But I, th there's a, there's a big gap between, finding Christ in, in prison and, and having someone help you uh, feed the sheep, so to speak, uh, of holding, they don't expect to have to hold a, a grown man's hand when he gets out of prison and, and mm -hmm. walk him every step of the way, but that's what they need mm -hmm. uh, to, to be able to be successful in, in staying out of that, that kind of lifestyle again. That's right, because it's almost like they're, they, they've been put to, in, they get out and they're almost put in a position to fail again. Yes. So. But thank God for those that don't fail. Thank God for those that do get out and, and have life-changing experiences and they're able to, to, to go and develop and do great and wonderful things. You know, praise be to God for them. Th yep. Those are the ones that, you know, we're thankful for, you know, and for what they're able to do. Unfortunately, in in so many cases they're kind of far and few between right um that's what we've got tonight guys uh I, we i apologize for the late start that we had tonight but that was fine. Uh, hopefully we muddled through it uh any prayer requests uh we need to do i know uh, uh we got uh one of our a couple of our workers have a have a family member that's a resident in the in the nursing home in Brownsville. And so whenever any, anything happens, they get a phone call to update them on the condition of mm -hmm. the facility. And they got another call today saying they got uh, confirmed case number two. Already? Uh, in the facility, yep. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think Friday night uh, is gonna mean a lot. Uh, hopefully I can get off uh, early enough to, to meet you guys and <clears throat> other people that'll be there. Uh, to do that, so uh, they're they're going to need uh, everyone there, staff and residents, both are going to need prayer uh, through this. Exactly. Anybody that's listening, we're going by and do a drive-by prayer time at uh, at the Brownsville Nursing Home on Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. You're you're more than welcome to come by. It's it's it's, it's a hit and run prayer. Uh, we want to lift up the residents as well as the staff. Right. Uh, that are there. That's going to be uh, April 24th at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, if anyone wants to join us in, in that endeavor, even if you're you're watching this from afar and you can't make it to the location, 
uh, if you can uh, pause a moment at that particular time or whatever you're at doing. At that time, yeah, please. And, uh, add your prayers to that. That would be greatly appreciated. It sure would. It sure would. And also, for, for not just for those there in Brownsville, but it, it seems like so many of our, our, our facilities are, are going through and having issues. And, and uh, uh, man, we just got to keep folks lifted up. We've got to lift them up. We've got to keep folks lifted up as we go through this time. Um, I'm, I'm prayerfully, I'm, I'm just praying that we are going to plateau or, or how do they say it? Uh, hit, hit a flat place and start going the other way. And, and, and soon we will be back to a, another new normal. <laughs> no. I, I don't think we'll ever be back where we were, but we'll be back to another new normal. Yeah, that's the, what was it they said? If, if we go back to the exact normal that we had before we missed a, a special opportunity for growth. Yeah, to get it right. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Let's pray for those that are lost. Uh, I, someone was telling me today that Bibles are, are really being sold and, and sold out mm -hmm. now. And I, I pray that people are opening them up. They're not just buying them and, and keeping them as tokens or, or souvenirs, but, uh, if, if your Bible is wore out, go buy you a new one. It'll have the same words in it. And just go on and get you a new one and, and go on and break it in real good. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if, if you can get it on your phone or your pad, whatever you've got, go on and get that Bible. Use that Bible and, and let that Bible help you day by day. It's nothing like a good uh, j just a good dose of the word every day. Any other prayer requests? All right. Rodney, would you pray us out? Father God, tonight we, we put our own opinions on your word, uh, Father, because we weren't there. We don't know. Uh, what john thought we don't know what peter thought but father we know the way the word speaks to us uh, when we read your word we know what we see in our minds and father we thank you that your word speaks to us that it's alive to us who believe father i just pray tonight that as we have studied this portion of the word uh, that we've been encouraged uh, that our hearts have been quickened that that we uh, we look at ourselves and we examine our situations. Uh, Father, it's easy to say, well, Peter should not have denied Christ, but we don't know, Father, what we would have done in that situation. That's right. Uh, it scares us to think that, that we might have to defend ourselves to a hostile crowd, and we might have to defend our, our, our Jesus to a hostile uh, audience. Mm -hmm. Father, I just pray for courage that when we see opportunities that we don't worry about whether it's a hostile environment. I pray that when we see in, uh, a time when we can speak your name in love, that we are not afraid. Father, let us take this example and let us, let us fish for souls. Mm. Father, I thank you for the work that Nick is doing, and I thank you for the ones who are participating. And Father, uh, help each of us just to reach out to our church family. Help us to stay connected. And the Father, help us most of all to stay connected with you. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 We thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll be back here again Sunday night at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time for our adult Sunday school. We hope to see you then. Uh, again, you can find us on Facebook at Community Church at Cedar Springs or on YouTube at Community Church in Cedar Springs. Uh, God bless and everyone stay safe.